Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Hey everyone, welcome. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. This is Drew hanging out here with you today. Now first, I wanted to uh, jump in and get into something. This had uh, just been reported out here on the interwebs in the last day or two. And it's a subject that hits very close to my heart. And that is uh, the words of John McTiernan. If the name is not familiar to you, let me just let you fill you in on who that is. Uh, he mostly is noted for directing the first and third Die Hard films. Uh, he also did Predator uh, and a couple of other ones. So he's not unfamiliar with the world of science fiction, not unfamiliar with action. And he's taken it upon himself when promoting a new film of his to specifically target that of Captain America. Uh, and the properties that, that Marvel has come out with concerning the Chris Evans character of Captain America. And this is and this is what he said. So I'm doing a, a direct quote here. He says, quote, I hate the majority of major studio films for political reasons. I can't really watch them. I'm annoyed the second they start. Captain America, I'm not joking. The cult of American hypermasculinity is one of the worst things to have happened in the world during the last 50 years. Hundreds of thousands of people have died because of this idiotic delusion. How is it possible to watch a film called Captain America? They're all making comic book adaptations. There's no, there's action, but no human beings. They're films made by fascists. They're making all the kids in the world think they'll never be important enough to have a film made about their life. And it's a unique moment in the history of cinema. It didn't used to be like this. A kid used to be able to learn how a man or a woman should act by watching films, morals, comics, make heroes for businesses, end quote. This is John McTiernan, director of Die Hard, which is a quintessential machismo film talking about hypermasculinity, which it's one of those buzzwords. And he goes on to use another one here by saying fascist. So the director of Die Hard, where one man kills a bunch of people en masse throughout the film and has no character arc whatsoever. He's, he's just as brash, almost just as insensitive at the end of the film as he starts. And trust me, I love Die Hard. It's my favorite Christmas movie. But if you think that your life is going to be as interesting as John McClane's, you got another thing coming. No one's life is as interesting as John McClane's. And that's another thing. It, it makes people believe that they'll never be important enough to have a film made about them. There are biopics being made more often than any other time right now. And I'm sorry, but most people's lives aren't interesting enough to have a movie made about them. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But to attack Captain America, and by the way, he says, watch a movie called Captain America and talk about hypermasculinity. What does Captain America have to do just in the name with hypermasculinity. Now you can argue jingoism or nationalism, sure, but but masculinity, I just don't understand. And when he says, and, and I also question in in reading this whether he's even watched any of the Captain America movies, because if you want to say that these are films that have action but no human beings, if he even knows the origin of Captain America, let's just go through the first one, First Avenger. Steve Rogers is not that guy. Steve Rogers is a sickly, underweight, poor kid from the Bronx who has repeatedly tried to get into the military to serve during World War II. And at one point in the movie, he tells his best friend, Bucky Barnes, 
when he's asked why he keeps trying is he says that other men are dying out there and I shouldn't be here cowering. I should be out there and I should be just another one of those guys doing what he can to help. Does does that sound inhuman? And by the way, he's he's not picked to be a super soldier because he wants to go kill Nazis, because he believes in uh, American power. He's not picked because he's a he's a meathead, uh, great soldier that will just follow orders. He's picked because he has heart. He's picked because he has respect for life. He is picked because he is a person that wants to do good. D- d- does that sound inhuman? Is that hyper masculine to you? And then in the next film, he finds out that the the people that he's been working for has been infiltrated by the bad guys. That Hydra has taken over Shield. And at one point in the movie, when when he he goes on the intercom and says, "I don't know how many of them there are." But they're about to do something very terrible, and I'm going to stop them, and I need your help. And he says, the price of freedom is high, but it's a price I'm willing to pay. Is, is that inhuman? Is that not a human being? He, he surrounds himself with these people. With either of the Carters, <laughs> Peggy or her great-grandniece or whatever. With Natasha Romanoff with Hawkeye, with Sam Wilson. They don't possess powers. They're humans. And then in the third one, in Civil War, where he says that I don't want my team to be controlled by the government, and he has a legitimate, intellectual, moral, as McTiernan wants to point out is vacant in these movies, has a moral standoff with Tony Stark and his supporters. Ha- has he watched the movies? Is is what I'm asking. He may look at the title and moan about it, but d- has he actually gone in and seen the content of these films? Because there's there's a part in it, and this is and this is again it, this is from Civil War, and this is what he says, because I don't want to I don't want to summarize it here. Where Steve says, uh, we or, Tony Stark says we're not who said we're giving up? And Captain America says we are if we're not taking responsibility for our actions, this document shifts the blame. And Rhodey responds, sorry, Steve, that is dangerously arrogant. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council. It's not SHIELD. It's not HYDRA. And Captain America says, no, but it's run by people with agendas and agendas change. This is, this is an argument that has human beings discussing and arguing, but there's heart behind it. There's a brain behind it. It's not terrorists come into Nakatomi Plaza and John McClane shoots him up. Tony also goes on to say, what if this panel sends us somewhere we don't think we should go? What if there's somewhere we need to go and they don't let us? We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. That's human. It's not, it's not an arrogant... Uh, remark on this guy who thinks that he knows best for everybody in the world. He just wants to keep his own conscience clean when it comes to these things. And you, you want to talk about the, the civil war, the whole backdrop of the film is based in this damage that has been caused by the Avengers in countries around the world where they were not asked to go. There, there, there is humanity there. The lady that approaches Tony Stark after the the MIT Expo shows the picture, and he holds that picture. That's his entire motivation for wanting to sign the Sokovia Accords, is because of a boy that we never had seen before. But through the process of making this film, they brought in, like, we really need something to ring true and bring this out. And what's it going to be? It's going to be the cost of human life. None of that is ever addressed in any Die Hard movie at any point. Not addressed in Predator. Nothing that McTiernan has been involved in. And he wants to argue that Captain America is the height of hyper-masculinity. And by the way, in in a nation that's fairly hypo-masculine, where where is that? Where is the masculinity? And is, is what Captain America portrays, is it too much? I... 
I got to tell you, I learned a lot from Captain America. And as I've learned a lot from Batman and Superman and all these other superheroes. Look, I understand I can't be physically Captain America because that was all contained in a bottle. But I can be a man like Captain America. I can't be a superhuman like Captain America. But these things that he stands for and his devotion to them, I, I, I just don't get – I don't see the hypermasculinity in it. Whoa, hey there. Hey there, meathead. I know you're saying this is really about this. What you're really trying to say is you need to work on your tan and go and go, uh, you know, hit on girls at the club or whatever he views as hypermasculinity. It's it's ridiculous. And in Civil War, at the end of the film, he says, Tony, I'm glad you're back at the compound. I don't like the idea of you rattling around a mansion by yourself. We all need family. The Avengers are yours, maybe more than mine. I've been on my own since I was 18. I never really fit in anywhere, even in the army. See, he's still a shy, a shy kid. My faith's in people, I guess, individuals. Whoa. Whoa there, Jim Rat. Whoa. Is that hypermasculine to you, or is that human? This is a Golden State Media Concept Sci-Fi Podcast. We'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G smcpodcast.com for more info. All right, everybody, we are back in the Golden State Media Concept Sci-Fi Podcast. We're back with you today. Um, continuing along that line, we talked a little bit about Civil War uh, there in the first segment. And one of the beloved characters that had come out of that film obviously had the introduction of a few. One of them being Black Panther, who's getting his own film uh, that Chadwick Boseman portrayed. He was awesome. But a heavy fan favorite coming out of that was the reintroduction of Spider-Man. It's still Peter Parker. Uh, he still got um, Aunt May living around there. And what had occurred was, because a lot of people had just read that, hey, they're going to bring Spider-Man into the fold on this. It was recast with Tom Holland um, as opposed to Andrew Garfield, who was the last Spider-Man that Sony had used. Uh, they had a falling out. And you can read all about that. <laughs> um, but Spider-Man had come out. And that had launched the new uh, partnership, if you will, between Marvel Studios and Sony Pictures. Uh, now, a lot of people that are just that just pay attention to comic book movies or superhero movies, they might know a few things about that the Avengers are owned by the same company, uh, comic publishing wise, as, as people like Spider Man. Uh, Fantastic Four, and and the X-Men. Now, before Marvel had gotten bought out by Disney, they sold rights to some of their characters, some of their film rights of their characters to different studios. There was no Marvel Studios at the time. Uh, the first Marvel Studios was actually – Marvel Studios film was Iron Man, where they decided to be their own. So they had at some point – um, sold the rights to a lot of these characters to other production studios, uh, such as Fox and Sony. So Fox owns the film rights to the X-Men, and essentially it's been established that they own the rights to the the mutant identity. And so when we see characters like Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch – which Quicksilver exists in the X-Men movies and the Marvel movies because he's not considered to be uh, an X-Men and he, he kind of – he can kind of float there. But in the Marvel movies, they can't say he's a mutant. So him and his sister have to be subject to sort of an experimentation. They're called enhanced. They can't be mutants. 
and they're I believe they they might end up working around that because there's one title called Inhumans, which they they might work that. It looks like it's been taken off the the slate though. So Fox owns X Men and those characters associated like Wolverine and Storm and Magneto and all the people that you've been seeing in those uh, in those uh, dismal Brian Singer movies that have come out here in the last few decades. So. So with that, we know that you're not going to see Captain America in an X-Men movie, just as you will not see Wolverine appear in an Avengers movie. Uh, now, they, they want to work. They, they're looking to work closer together. <clears throat> and there's a lot of rumors about uh, Fox working out a deal with them to have them produce these films but still be distributed by Fox just so they can play in the same sandbox together. Because that's what Sony has done. Sony had fair success with their Spider-Man films. Uh, the Tobey Maguire, Sam Raimi ones, and these uh, Mark Webb, Andrew Garfield films. There was success, but there was not the level of success that they know they could have bringing him into the fold with the Avengers. I mean, when you're when you're looking at box office and your films are seeing an M behind it and then these other ones are seeing a B behind it, you know that there is a good deal to be made by letting him get into that realm. So Sony still retains the rights because they, they bought the rights for Spider-Man. And Sony retains the rights technically of distribution for making the movie, but they're partnering with Marvel because that can allow him to appear alongside these characters like Iron Man and, and Ant-Man and Black Panther and Captain America. So not only was it a, a culmination of a lot of fanboys' desire to see Spider-Man finally on screen with all these other heroes, but what people who had known about the, uh, the film rights – finally waiting for that deal to get done. And there's a lot of other contingencies involving um, how many films have to be made before the rights revert back to Marvel. And Fox has been a little bit more stingy about it, but Sony's been willing to work with it. In fact, I, I think the rights for uh, Fantastic Four has already been returned back. So with the new Tom Holland, Peter Parker uh, being introduced in Civil War, now they've launched into... I mean, almost immediately started making the next Spider-Man movie. They they were really ramping up and prepping for it. It's called Spider-Man Homecoming. And it's really, it, I mean, in as much as it's going to be involved around Homecoming in high school, it's also kind of a nod to Spider-Man coming home to the Marvel Universe. And Tom Holland, who you saw in Civil War, and he was great. He, he's the only one who actually attempted to sound like he's uh, from New York. He's in it. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. will also be in it, making a cameo as Tony Stark because he made the suit, obviously. Marissa Tomei is coming back as Aunt May. Uh, I believe, and it, it kind of goes back and forth, Michael Keaton was in, then he was out, and now he's back in. Uh, they have him listed here as the Vulture. Uh, a really interesting, another nod to the fans is Donald Glover has been cast in the film, and... For a while, when they were talking about rebooting Spider-Man, they were there was a lot of internet fervor for Donald Glover being the new Spider-Man, and they really thought they they there was a lot of people out on the boards and on on the websites pushing for him, and he did ultimately get cast uh, playing the voice of Miles Morales in the Spider-Man cartoon, but now he's going to be in this. Uh, new Spider-Man. And who knows? They don't really have a character listed, but maybe he will possibly be close. Maybe he will be Miles Morales. I don't know. Um, and a great deal of uh, of comic relief. Hannibal Burris is going to be in the film. Uh, Bokeem Woodbine. So they're, it's a pretty diverse cast that they're bringing in. It's a very young class too. One of the key differences that you're going to see in this film and the next one coming after, he's going to stay in high school for a while. Uh, the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield movies, uh, they had him in high school, but it was sort of the end. And then the next one, he was out in the world. The The folks at Marvel really want to keep him inside of high school operating you know, as a 16 or 17-year-old superhero. 
because that's what he was originally. And they think there's a good amount of character development that can be done with a very young Spider-Man and seeing the type of uh, action that he gets involved in as well as the type of stories that he gets involved in. And it's another one of those things. You know, I want to go back. I want to go back to McTiernan's words there. When you look at a character like Spider-Man, is that is there anything hyper masculine about Spider-Man? Uh, I mean, most would argue that that no, and that's one of that's part of the appeal that he has is that he relates to the smart kids and he relates to you know the people that were picked on, and he just kind of becomes a version. You know, through through an accident, of course, but becomes a hero, but uses his intellect as well as his new physical abilities, and and we appreciate that as fans. We appreciate a smart hero. That's why Indiana Jones was one of my favorites growing up because he was intelligent. So they got this going on. Spider Man is back uh, in the fold with Marvel. Who knows? I mean, it's only been confirmed that Tony Stark's going to be in it. As they as they film now, there's probably going to be a lot of leaks and stuff as far as uh, who shows up on set and all these other things. But we're we're locked in for a lot of mentions. I mean, with with him operating in New York, there could be the possibility of mentioning characters like Daredevil or Iron Fist or the Punisher, um, as the Punisher's first appearance was in the Spider-Man comic. Or Jessica Jones, all of those taking place in New York, all of them inhabiting the same what would be entertainment universe, cinematic universe, uh, whether that could be mentioned too, and the possibility of one of those characters either showing up or Spider-Man coming into the fold in one of those Netflix shows. So the the door has been kicked wide open on this, and it's going to be very fun to see. So Spider-Man Homecoming, that's probably going to be about another year until that comes out, but I'm very excited about it. All right, you're listening to the Golden State Media Concept Sci-Fi Podcast. We'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Hey, everybody. We are back uh, in this last segment of the show here. Um, so new Ghostbusters and again, I, I, I've gone on about this a little bit here in the last couple of, uh, or in a, a couple of shows it's, it's coming out here, uh, here on Friday, I'm going to be taking my daughter to it as I previously mentioned, but on this show and sort of in honor as we also did with the new independence day flick, uh, really wanting to pay homage to the original, The first that came out, yes, this one is not a sequel to the original uh, 1984 and 1989 films, but even as a reboot, it is said that there's going to be some nods and stuff to the original, and uh, as I've already explained, I'm going to put, put my biases and preconceived notions on the back burner to try and enjoy it as its own film and try to enjoy it uh, for my daughter's sake, but... In any case, a couple of days ago, I sat down with my daughter to watch the original Ghostbusters films because they're my favorite and I wanted to share that with her. And she's concerned about scary parts, um, but she also wants to see the slime monster, which I I told her would be in the new one. Uh, And so we sat down, we watched the first Ghostbusters. She was very excited very excited when the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man came out, and we watched it. And it's it's still 
it's still a great film. It's still fun to watch. It's still funny to watch. Everything about it still holds up. And even though it came out, you know, Ms. Maiden in 83, 84 and came out in 84, as far as an effects film goes, it was it was pretty cutting edge at the time. And there was and there was puppet work and there was um, a lot of like camera tricks and stuff to make everything work. And I I still think it's great. I think it's a great movie that holds up very well. Um, the acting in it as well as just just the characters. They're they're phenomenal. But we all know about that. We all know about that concerning Ghostbusters. It's it's number two. When we started watching it, it takes place five years later. So this is in uh this is in eighty nine and the Ghostbusters have since been they'll tell you the backstory that they were sued by everybody and they were shut down. And Dana Barrett is reintroduced into the story within the span of this five years. Her and Peter have broken up. She had gotten married and then had a kid. Now, that part of her life, although the kid is an incredibly pivotal piece of the plot in the movie, her being married is – it's an afterthought. It's barely mentioned. We're not really sure about what happened, whether the guy died or left him. But my daughter could not – this was – this became a cold case file to my daughter who just kept asking about this this estranged husband and I, and I didn't get it. And I was sitting there watching the movie with her and Peter comes out and just like, you got married. And then it kind of, you know, kind of grazed over that. And mostly anybody would have been like, okay, that part's done and it didn't work out. Fine. She has a baby. It's not Peter's. Whatever. And my daughter starts asking me, who's – Who's the who's her husband? I was like, I don't, I don't know. They don't they don't really talk about him much else for the rest of the movie. When are when are they going to show the husband? I'm like, Evelyn, they're not going to show him. It, that part's done. Nobody cares about what happened to the guy. It's not important. And I thought it was done. Then 20 minutes later, when. They're in Peter's apartment. They're laying him down and everything else. She looks at me. She goes, do you know what her husband's name was? And I was like, nobody cares. Nobody cares about this lady's husband that's not in the movie and isn't a Ghostbuster and isn't a part of anything. Why do you continue on talking about this guy? I didn't understand it. And I was sort of like, just stop. Just stop talking about this guy. It's not important. Here's the Ghostbusters. And here's what they got to do. And the slime makes people angry or happy. Like, just just chill out. And that stayed on my mind for the last couple of days. And I was like, why Why was she just so obsessed with finding out about this guy who was, like, mentioned in a hindsight? And, like, no, he wasn't important at all to the movie. He was just a device used so that, that Dana could have this baby. And the more I thought about it, I, the more it grew on me of how sweet it was that my daughter cared about giving an identity to this person that this person was married to a main character in the movie and then was a father of a baby and that she wanted she wanted this guy to have an actual identity in this world as opposed to just being you know some afterthought and it and it just makes me just makes me love my daughter even more that she cared so much about it well, I I must have seen Ghostbusters 2, you know, I've probably seen over 100 times and I I never cared about that circumstance or situation in the movie. And my daughter right right on it was just wanting to know about this other guy and, you know, as a father and as a husband and it was it was super adorable and I love her for it. And she's super excited to see this new movie. And I don't uh, – I'm not excited. I'm excited for my daughter. I'm excited for her to see a Ghostbusters film in theater. I'm excited for her to uh, see these characters that were – that are honestly were kind of made for her and made for her generation and to see how she responds to it. Now, I've read and seen a lot of things that – you're going to say this film's going to be a dumpster fire. I actually, I took my daughter to go see Secret Life of Pets. And before the movie came on, they had a preview for Ghostbusters. And one when the preview ended, a guy actually booed 
out loud. So the review ended. People were like, ah, and he goes, boo. And people, because mostly it was mothers there with their kids. It's kind of like, you know, shushed them or told them to shut up. But there's a lot of negative feelings toward the movie. I understand them. But for the sake of my daughter, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm going to give it a chance. And she's super excited. But then again, <clears throat> I've also read from what you know my friends don't like to go on a lot of websites that just seem like there's people from the studios that are paid to write positive reviews they try to make them as fairly they try to go to like really as objective as you can be but just independently operated object objective i'm not saying their opinions aren't subjective it's obviously their opinion but <clears throat> they aren't financed by studios to write positive reviews but some of them have been out there have been actually writing very positive things about it <clears throat> which, you know, um, that could be good. So I'm going in open-minded, going in open-minded. I want it to be a good show, at least in enough to to live up to the Ghostbusters name. And I want it to be good for my daughter and to have something that when we sit down later, after it comes out, that she wants to watch it, I won't have to begrudgingly watch it. So going to see that here on Friday you know, I'll, I'll report back. I'll let you guys know at some other point about, uh, how I feel about it, but that's coming out Friday. Uh, and I will be more than happy to let you guys know my thoughts and feelings on the movie. Go out and see and support it. I mean, if, if for nothing else, I want the film to do well so they can continue to, it was supposed to be the first of an expanded Ghostbusters universe to see what possible, um, other films they might make concerning it, but it also to keep making these, science fiction but science driven uh adventure action films so it, it really does it really does a service by going to see i'm not saying hey just go see it i'm saying hey if 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 there's a if there's some part of you that wants to give it a chance then then listen to that part and go ahead and go see it a lot of people a lot of my friends are like hey stop hating on the ladies it's gonna be awesome hey don't don't jump the gun on that don't jump the gun on it. I know a lot of people say like they won't say that it looks good, but they're just assuring me that it's going to be good. But I, I I'm not saying either way. I'm saying the jury has yet to to hear the case, and then me being the jury will deliberate and and I'll I'll render a verdict in that particular case. All right, everybody. I want to thank you for listening. You can check us out on uh, gsmcpodcast.com and get us from there as well as iTunes or really another forum where you can get podcasts and subscribe. You can also get other fine Golden State Media Concepts uh, programming our shows from there. You can check us out and follow us on Facebook and or Twitter, whatever your preference is. I have been Drew. You have been wonderful. Thanks for tuning in. You have a great day.